the Roman Empire was a fascist dictatorship. The Romans were a society based around obedience, which used icons and symbols as their form of spirituality. This was much different than that of the Messianic Jews, which the empire was at war with. The Messianic Jews relied on their text more than symbols to express their spirituality. This was a big problem for the Romans because the Messianic Jewish religion did not align itself with Roman values. The Romans tried to install statues of the Caesars in all the temples of Judea, otherwise known as Palestine. This incensed the Jewish people because it was against their religion to have physical representations of cultic deities. There was an organization within the Roman Empire known as the Imperial Cult. Deceased emperors could be voted a state divinity through the act of apotheosis. This was used by the standing emperors to associate themselves with the lineage of so-called gods. Unpopular or unworthy predecessors were also excluded. The Flavian Vespasian was able to use the imperial cult to establish a dynasty after Nero killed himself in prison following the Civil War. The granting of apotheosis served religious, political, and moral judgment on imperial rulers. The, the development of imperial rule from participant to dominant, the role of the Senate was increasingly marginalized and military loyalty became key to imperial authority. The framework for the imperial cult was formulated during the early principate of Augustus and was rapidly established throughout the empire and its provinces with marked local variations in its representation and expression. The Romans were very involved with botany and cultivation of plants. The imperial cult was an extension of this philosophy into human society. In 66 BCE, the Jews had rebelled against Rome and succeeded. They set up a nation-state inside the empire, which became a big threat to Rome because it could serve as an example for the other provinces that dared to defy the empire. The Romans grew tired of constantly having to put down rebellion by force to maintain their order. They realized that the virtues of the messianic religion was what the Romans needed to infiltrate and change. The Messianic Jews were extremely aggressive towards outsiders and strictly exclusionary to non-Jews. This is revealed in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the only documents to survive the Messianic period. Joseph Atwell describes in his book Caesar's Messiah how Christianity was used to pacify the opposition to Rome. The Flavians knew they couldn't simply crush Jerusalem militarily. They also had to control their hearts and minds. After the war, the city is looted and the religious documents are raided. The Romans stole all of the Messianic religious texts and burned most of them. The Romans kept the original text and studied them with the help of Josephus, a Jewish propaganda minister for the Flavians. The Arch of Titus is built and depicts the victory of the Romans over the Jews. Christianity is then created by intellectuals working for the Flavian emperors. The seven gospels are encoded with a simple yet complex method known as typology. If you compare the life of Jesus, Moses, and Titus, certain parallels emerge. If you compare the War of the Jews as well as the biography of Josephus with the New Testament, certain parallels also emerge. The story of Jesus' ministry told in the Gospels was constructed as a prophetic satire of Titus Flavius' military campaign through Judea. The Gospels were written in such a way as to create the allegory of Vespasian being the father, his oldest son Titus being the son, and Domitian, Vespasian's younger son, being the Holy Ghost. This satire used typological parallels to show that Titus was the real Christ that Christians have been unwittingly worshipping. Atwell goes on to say that the Gospels were most likely written after the war and backdated 40 years to make it look as though the Gospels had prophesied the return of Jesus as Titus. In the New Testament, Jesus prophesied that he would return 
in a lifetime after his death. A lifetime in Judea is 40 years. Titus conquered Judea exactly 40 years after the death of Jesus. Thus Titus had fulfilled the title of a world ruler that would emerge out of Palestine. Jesus made three specific prophecies about his return. The first is that the towns of Galilee would be destroyed. In 66 CE, the towns of Galilee are destroyed by Vespasian and Titus. A Jewish rebel named Josephus was captured there. Josephus tells Vespasian that in the Jewish text it is prophesied that he will become the emperor of Rome, which he does. Vespasian likes Josephus and for this convinces him to become a turncoat instead of killing him. In 69 CE, the Flavian Vespasian comes to power while his son Titus stays behind to plot the takeover of Jerusalem. The second thing that Jesus prophesied was that Jerusalem would be surrounded by a wall. In 66 CE, Titus Flavius surrounds Jerusalem with a wall. This was a tactic used by Titus to oppress the Jews with famine. Josephus wrote about a woman named Mary, who called her son a nymph of the world. She then slayed him, ate him, and turned him into a human Passover lamb. In the Gospels, Jesus says during the Last Supper, Take, eat this is my body, this is my blood, thereby turning him into a human Passover lamb. This typological link seems to suggest an allegory about cannibalism in the wake of starvation brought on by the wall. The third prophecy that Jesus foretold was that the temple would be raised, leaving not one stone on top another. Jesus did exactly this. After he had pressed the Jews with famine, he raided Jerusalem and destroyed their sacred temple, leaving not one stone on top another. The translation of the word gospel in Greek is evangelon, which means good news of military victory. The Battle of Gadara, the Battle of Galilee, and the Battle of Jerusalem were all military victories of the Roman armies. This leads one to ask a fundamental question. Why are military victories by the Roman armies being celebrated in the Gospels if the Jews actually wrote them? The answer is that they most likely were not. The Romans had tightly controlled literature, and the printing of the Gospels was a large undertaking. Joseph Atwell says that this was made possible by three major families the Flavians, the Alexanders, and the Herods. The Flavians had the military might. The Alexanders were a Jewish family that had served as the tax collectors of Rome, so they provided the money. Princess Bernice, granddaughter of Hera the Great, was part of the Herod family, which was a product of intermarriage with the conquered Jewish Messianic lineage. They had provided the insider knowledge along with people like Josephus in order to draft the Gospels. The Gospels are a complicated way of saying that the Flavians have become the Christ of the Jews as a trophy of war. They created the religion to serve as a theological barrier to prevent Messianic Judaism from erupting against the Empire once more. They also sought to destroy the Gnostic version of Christianity by replacing the Trivium with their own dogma. Once the Empire was turned but was united with uh, the new uh, religion. Uh, some of it was directed toward the persecution of uh, paganism, you know, paganism and pagan rituals and, uh, and beliefs were uh, ruled uh, uh, forbidden on penalty of death already around 385 AD. And um, why would you need to do that, you know? Well, when you look at the historical record, there is absolutely no record of early Christian ideologues or converts wanting to coexist with pagans or with the leaders and representatives of the mystery schools. They did everything they could to eliminate them. And you know, in many cases, Henrik, they didn't need the force of uh, the military force of the Roman emperor to do that. The, uh, the, the monks 
who were early monks who were created to uh, who were converted to Christianity were like stormtroopers. Hmm. And one uh, one historian describing the takeover of uh, Egypt by Christianity actually uses that term. It says that the Christian monks were so fanatical they were like stormtroopers. They went into the ancient sanctuaries of mystery knowledge in Egypt, the temples of Luxor, the temples of uh, of Pindera, uh, and, which is close to Nag Hammadi and the temples of Memphis and around Cairo, and they fanatically destroyed and burned all these books. It didn't need the military to do it. The religious converts did it themselves. And the history of the rise of Christianity is, is, the, is the history of a cultural genocide of an enormous magnitude. Atwell talks about a root and branch satire hidden in a typological narrative between Josephus and the New Testament. The satire is related to the Roman understanding of botany and homeopathic medicine by introducing a tamed strain of a species into a colony of wild plants. A hybrid lamer plant would result. The Greek naturalist Theophrodus, a Roman scientist and physician who accompanied Vespasian and Titus to Judea, describes the pruning necessary to cultivate wild plants. His work on plants specifically covered the process by which wild olive trees could be transformed into cultivated ones. The leaders of the Jewish rebellion can be seen as a wild olive tree which must be cultivated. Josephus in the New Testament develop a comic theme regarding the Messiah who was captured on the Mount of Olives. In the War of the Jews by Josephus, the punishment of the unnamed certain young man captured on the Mount of Olives was with death, which directly translated to Greek is kalaze kalusis, or commanded to be pruned. The use of the word pruned to describe the fate of the certain young man is part of a broad satirical theme within the New Testament. The leaders of the Jewish rebellion were used as the historical tree onto which Christianity was grafted. The use of the word pruned is an extremely cynical metaphor in this typological reading of the Gospels. In the New Testament, the garden that Jesus wanders into while on the Mount of Olives is called Gethsemane, an Aramaic word that is usually translated as olive press. However, as Klausner points out, the word is difficult and may be related to wine. Beth Shamanea is the name used in the Talmud to describe a hall of wine and oil. The way that it is used in the context of the starvation brought on by the wall. Cannibalism engaged in by the besieged Messianic Jews was the basis of the Christian concept of the Messiah who offers up his flesh. Lazarus was a son of Mary whose flesh was eaten as a symbolic paschal lamb. The name of the Christ who was captured on the Mount of Olives and executed by the Romans was Eleazar. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they had made him a supper. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. In the Bible there are several characters referred to as Eleazar. Josephus gives the name of Mary's father as Eleazar, which in Greek is Lazarus, the name of the individual whom Jesus raised from the dead. Eleazar typologically can be plural, referring to the Messianic branch of the Jews. Eleazar was the real savior who shares many parallels with Jesus. That is, being born in Galilee, having the power to dispel demons, they were both plotted against by the high priestesses, scorched, survived crucifixion, and risen from the dead. These Eleazars are the only individuals within these works with so many of Jesus-like attributes. Eleazar was captured on the Mount of Olives. The capture of an unnamed certain young man on the Mount of Olives is parallel to another passage within the War of the Jews in which Eleazar is whipped and escapes crucifixion. 
Titus had ordered many of the messianic leaders to be put to death by crucifixion. There is a story in Josephus' biography where Josephus had begged Titus to let three of his friends live at a place called Tekoa. They were cut down. Two of them died and one of them lived under the physician's hands. Thus Eleazar had been pruned. As you can tell from the Paris Edwin Psalter, there are two messiah-like figures in the same drawing. The individual who survived crucifixion at Tekoa was the messiah or Christ. He was the only savior of the three. Joseph of Arimathea in the life of Josephus and Joseph bar Matthias in the New Testament arranged for the survivors to be taken down from the cross. This is to say that the last names of the two Josephs, Josephus of Barmathias and Joseph of Arimathea, are homophonically similar. Arimathea is an obvious play on Josephus' last name, Barmathias, which is quite similar to the Iscariot Sicari. The Sicari was the last name referred to by Josephus as a sect of the Messianic Jewish people. In the War of the Jews, a story takes place in the land of Baras, where a sort of rue named Baras grew. Baras appears to be a play on the word for sun, Bar, reminiscent of the manner in which Sakari was perhaps deliberately misspelled as Iscariot. The individual who survived his crucifixion at Thekoa is also linked to an Eleazar who was captured on the Mount of Olives, who was revived by the physician Pedantius Discordates, in that Josephus states that it was a physician who restored him to life. There is an Eleazar in the fortress of Herodian who pitched a camp at Thekoa. Josephus asked about whether Thekoa was a fit place to camp. Later this question was answered when he committed suicide at Masada. Thekoa, or Theokoyus, is the name of a Roman god of the questioning intellect. The point being made here is that the irrational Jewish messiah was taken to the place of a discerning or questioning intellect. In the New Testament, Paul states that it was an olive tree that is to be grafted onto, the olive tree being, of course, the tree that would be pruned on the Mount of Olives. The passages work together to create a story describing the Roman capture of the messianic root of the Jews, Eleazar, and their pruning of him and transforming him into Jesus, the demon-dispelling pro-Roman messiah. The branches are described as either being pruned or being grafted onto. Jesus predicts, echoing the book of Malachi, that those branches that do not abide in the new Judaism he brings will be burned. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire. There he was, as Titus ordered, pruned, and as Paul described, grafted onto with a new root, and thus transformed into a messiah deemed rational by the Romans. The Eleazar, captured by Pedantius on the Mount of Olives, is taken to Thekoa, where he is hung on a tree that is crucified and is, as Titus ordered, pruned. The botanist and physician Pedantius then grafts the magic root of Baras onto him. This process transforms Eleazar from a root that causes the Jews to be possessed by a demonic spirit into the root that dispels demons. Eleazar has become Jesus. Once Eleazar has been satirically pruned and grafted onto at Tekoa, he is given back to the Jews at Maturus.
In this way, the Romans introduce a tame or domesticated plant into a field of wild ones to decrease the wildness of later generations. Those Jews who accept the tamed Messiah and his pro-Roman doctrines are allowed to live. Masada, however, another Eleazar, a parallel to the Eleazar at Herodian, refuses to surrender and commits suicide. The point here is that refusal to surrender and accept the new Judaism is tantamount to suicide. The savior they created was a Roman fantasy, a literary figure they used to prophetically chasten the wicked generation and set up their satire regarding the Messiah that Titus had pruned, Eleazar. The New Testament makes the Jews out to be the enemy, even though the Romans had crucified Jesus. This is explained typologically through the metaphor of the root. As explained before, the Sicarii was what Josephus referred to as the infected or rebellious Messianic Jewish people. The New Testament and Josephus often engage in humor regarding the identity of the sun or magical rue, which has been around since the times of Herod and would probably have lasted much longer had it not been cut down by those Jews. The land of Baras where a sort of rue also named Baras grew, Baras being a play on the word for sun. Josephus also defines the word demons as spirits of the wicked, thus supporting the idea that the wicked Sicarii were possessed by demons and were unclean spirits in the demons of Gadara, as well as the idea that the demons Eleazar is exercising are Jewish rebels. The meaning of the tale of the magic root of Baras within the root and branch satire is easy to understand. It documents the existence of a metaphorical root that has the power to remove demons. In Mark and Luke, when Jesus asks the demon his name, the demon replies, my name is Legion, for we are many. Mark 5.9 Josephus writes that their group was too small for an army and too many for a gang of thieves. A legion describes just such a number of fighting men. While the root and branch interplay in the Bible and the works of Josephus can serve as a metaphor for Christianity, that being the esoteric aspect of the Roman agenda, the root and branch can also be seen in an exoteric sense as well. While not much is known about how the Messianic Jews practiced their religion and the Dead Sea Scrolls being the only pre-Roman document of the Messianic Jewish culture, it is not uncommon for food and mind-altering substances to be at the heart of religious customs and practices. The Romans were very interested in taking dangerous plants and domesticating them 
In their eyes, the empire was simply a plant and messianic Jews were simply a branch that needed to be cultivated or pruned, much like how the Roman leaders would usurp the position of the gods in the microcosm, the Roman Empire usurped the position of the tree of life in the macrocosm. This new branch of Christianity would be domesticated and grafted onto the tree of the Roman Empire. The branch of Christianity would eventually be used to cultivate the entire Roman Empire. Like any plant, they would try to domesticate. They don't want to kill it. Part of this would be to control what they put into their bodies as far as food, herbs, and other drugs. The mandrake being a wild and dangerous plant would make it a prime candidate for the Romans to try and domesticate. Well, not much is known about what drugs, if any, were used by the Messianic Jews before the war. One can speculate that after the war, the Romans might have come in and switched out their ceremonial drugs with domesticated versions or different mixtures of certain substances to create more passive states of being that being the use of the Gospels to control and undo what was done with things like what was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. One would have to assume that this was also done with other aspects of the culture. Notice the use of the scrolls and the mushrooms in these pictures of early Christian art. They are used in combination with each other in order to control the men. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of ancient writings containing nearly all of the Old Testament. They were discovered in caves near the Dead Sea of Qumran in 1947 in the mid-1950s. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written in the Semitic language of Aramaic between 2050 BCE and 136 CE. John Allegro was one of several researchers that was allowed to work on the Dead Sea Scrolls translating them. He was the only agnostic researcher on the team that was allowed to work with the scrolls. The scrolls were controlled by a small group of scholars headed up by John Strugnall. In 1990, Strugnall gave an interview to Haaretz in which he said that Judaism is a horrible religion which should not exist. He also said that Judaism was a Christian heresy and we deal with our heretics in different ways. You are a phenomenon which we haven't managed to convert, and we should have managed. By 1968, Allegro completed and published all of his translations of the Cave 4 scroll fragments. He was the only researcher of that team to publish all of his findings publicly. The other researchers waited longer to publish most of their findings because of how controversial these scrolls were, and what they meant to Christianity. The remaining scrolls were not published until 1991, when the Huntington Library in San Marino, California finally released photographs of the scrolls in order to expedite their publication. The other members of the original team held on to most of their translations until after 1997. 
Allegro was asked several times to hold back on some of his translations for several years or face retribution. He sometimes reluctantly complied. And, you know, just as, as to, you know, people talk about the, you know, the Qumran and, and the Essenes, these were sort of the classic ideas about the scrolls that were developed when they were first found, but I, I don't necessarily agree with them. I think that the, uh, the scrolls were actually a, a literature that was produced by a number of different people that are, and not necessarily at Qumran, but throughout a lot of different places and, and brought together. And, well, on. because they're, they're a library of right. the revolutionary movement, of the, of the militaristic sure. Christian movements of its theology. You know, the war scroll, the massive government, the community rule, these are, these are outlines of how their organization um, controlled their members and the kind of obedience and theology that they were supposed to maintain. So it's, a, it's not, the, and the Essene, I mean, that is a word that comes from Josephus primarily, but even there, um, he actually talks about the Essenes as members who were fighting against the Romans. So they weren't some sort of hermit-like uh, sure. monastic. They were warriors, and the uh, the cult that produces the scroll literature are just, you know, it's a warrior cult. I mean, it's it's a you know they are all about violence and uh, and, and getting rid of the Romans. So that's really what what is producing their literature and. Um, you know, it's a very interesting idea, though, that the Romans may have been attempting to use herbal, uh, um, um, you know, medicine, because they go into a long description of, uh, not, not in the description of the plant and where they get the rue and all this, but then they, they play off of that, and they talk about, after the war, the Flavian emperors in a room, Vespasian, Titus, and uh, Domitian are in a room, and they're using the root right mm -hmm. to get the the demonic spirit out of people and they talk about putting the root in the nose and when i read that i thought you know this could actually be representing some kind of you know plant that they're sure. using as a as a psychoactive drug because they talk about pulling it out and then immediately as soon as it's in there the person loses the demonic spirit they actually have that, and and they, and they, these passages are not in Josephus. It's hard really to understand it because it's a vast, you know, book. It has thousands of passages, and you have to kind of trace through the the typology, how they link the passages it's, it's, together. It's the use of psychoactive substances for the pacification Good of way. the of the masses, which I think is exactly what they did with psychedelics in the sixties and seventies. Some of the ethnomycologists of the 1960s had suggested that the foundations of Hinduism and early Judaism were based on drug cults that used the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Allegro came to the conclusion based on his knowledge of the Bible, the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
and ancient history and language concluded that the foundations of Christianity started in a similar cult-like fashion. Only on the grass, inadvertently. Yeah. But uh, to continue uh, our story, mm. um, you've told uh, mm. the cross uh, is now mm. a mushroom. Yes. What is the meaning of the cross and crossing in the mushroom uh, story? Let's well, say. because uh, the, one of the old Hebrew names of the mushroom was the little cross. The little cross and I flanker. think myself that the whole crucifixion story yes. although of course there was crucifixion and it was meted out as a punishment to rebels and so on and so forth I think the idea of the God being crucified yes. on this piece of wood was made to was, was a piece of mushroom mythology they saw the cross oh. as as a as a mushroom shape you yes. see and they they Per, per, uh, they, they understood this figure as being splayed out mm -hmm. on the cross as the risen mushroom open mm -hmm. wide in the, mm -hmm. with its canopy on top. And I, I, I suspect that that's, uh, that's where it's come from and that's mm -hmm. the origin of the crucifixion motif within the, uh, the story mm -hmm. of the New Testament. That mushroom is a very strong one, isn't a it? Very a very strong, strong one. I wouldn't advise anybody to no? play with it. No, no, no. not at all. I wouldn't. <laughs> But it's a very beautiful thing. Yes. But one is. can see from that kind of thing how how folklore can grow up about it. Mm. I yes. mean, the phallic shape, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, it yeah. opens out into a canopy, yeah. a little cross, mm -hmm. as yes. the Hebrew calls it. Yeah. Yes. And so the Which stories begin to mount. In 1967, Professor Ramsbottom of London's Botanical Museum contacted Allegro. Ramsbottom is likely the proper founder of the field of ethnomycology. In 1970 he published his book The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. In this book Allegro puts forth conclusions that reveal that Christianity is a derivative of astrotheology but he also says that much of the origins of Christianity is rooted in fertility cults and psychedelic drug use especially that of the Amanita muscaria mushroom. The publication of The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross destroyed his career. I'm puzzled. Uh, are you really seriously suggesting that Jesus Christ was a mushroom? I uh, put pretty blankly, yes. Surely you don't suggest that Jesus Christ and his various disciples were not human creatures? Yes. You are dealing with a, a secret cult, a secret society. The stories of the New Testament contain certain incantations, certain magic names, were, which were really the names of the mushrooms. No, but and the writers, the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, these men who wrote the story, you are telling me they did not exist? No. no. None of them existed? No, it, it's part of mythology. It's part of mushroom mythology. Several other people in the same field as Allegro attacked him publicly, like... Gordon M. Wasson, who was later revealed to be a gatekeeper in the field who was placed there by the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the messianic branch um, that is the heart of the symbolism in the Gospels and Josephus um, is also the heart of the symbolism in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, they, they talk about this this root, the branch of Jesse, and uh, this is the, the lineage of the Christ. So the, the symbolism that Josephus develops, um, you know, really plays off of this connection between the, this, this, this branch, this plant that the Jews cut off, clearly relating back to the, to the concept that the Jews were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ, um, that this plant then becomes domesticated by the Romans and then is used against the Jews. So, you know, getting back to Allegro, um, you know, it just, it doesn't surprise me at all that, you know, that, that you can actually, what, once the Gospels, the typology of the Gospels is uh, decoded and you can actually understand Josephus and the Gospels clearly, it doesn't surprise me at all that there is some support for Allegro's uh, uh, work. The, 
the idea that um, a lot of people have that, that his ideas was just essentially insane oh, is, sure. is just the, uh, you know, th this is, these are just nonsensical positions. Allegro was a really, uh, a really, um, you know, just, if, if you, particularly if you listen to his, uh, any video of him or, you know, of him talking, he's just a really brilliant guy yeah. and a really great scholar. And so um, it's just such a revolutionary idea. It frightens people. No one wants to get near it. Allegro was also, you know, getting too close to truths about Christianity. Um, and so I think it was just really easy to dismiss yeah. him. I think Christianity and Judaism for that matter. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it, the idea was, um, I, I, I'm not familiar with Allegro's final work. I haven't read those books, but I just from listening to you talk, what I suspect is, is that... Um, his work into the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, you know, had frightened him because in the scrolls they talk about um, essentially genocide of the Gentiles. They right. talk about a holy war that ends up with... You You're know, talking something. about the war scroll. The war scroll, yeah. And, um, uh, and so this is the symbolic battle, final mm -hmm. battle, which essentially is at the end of days where you have um, extermination, uh, you know, just an annihilation of the Gentile race. and this, I suspect, um, in combination with, you know, problematic passages in the Torah that um, describe slavery of Gentiles um, and, and how, how, it's, how it's a divinely sanctioned, uh, you know, state, um, probably, you know, brought Allegro to, you know, a, a point where he wanted to have some response to it, where he wanted to uh, get it in the open and have it discussed. Um, and I don't think that was something that, uh, uh, at that point, particularly you're very close to the end of World War II, you know, the Holocaust is getting a tremendous um, amount of, of sort of emotional energy rolling, you know, as it sure. goes through culture. And that would be cutting against that to bring out these kinds of ideas. And then there's also, uh, Allegra was going right at the heart of Christianity because if he was able to link the Dead Sea Scrolls into a true Christianity, a, a Jewish Christianity, then the character of Jesus Christ becomes suspect. Because how do you get, um, you know, how do you have this, this group, the, the Jewish Messianic movement with a Christ that is so violent, so xenophobic, in the same location, the same place, same time, with this so-called Jesus Christ character. So I just think Allegra was cutting against the, the powerful... Um, all these powerful interests in every case. I mean, just right. everything the guy was doing. Right. Uh, you know, and, that, and, that's and, just, and that's how that's how scholarship really profound scholarship is. It just and it just cuts across all the the, the nonsense and it scares everybody. <laughs>
and when the man at once fell down, he adjourned the demon never to come back to him. Speaking Solomon's name and reciting the incantations which he had composed. What's interesting, you took that quote, from, was that from Josephus? The quote is from Josephus, but he is, okay. quote, he is actually paraphrasing right. an earlier an herbalist, uh, Pedantius Decordates, who actually had the description, and he, he referred to it as the mandrake. Got it, got it. And he now, says the mandrake had to be handled in a very precise right. way in order to not kill the person who was taking it. Now, interestingly, back. what Josephus has done is it sounds like he's compounded two different plants. It sounds like he's compounded Syrian rue, which is Paganum harmala, which acts as an MA, MAOI and uh, as harmaline and harmamine, I believe, and it's psychoactive on its own, okay? And used together with uh, plants that contain DMT, it creates uh, what is called ayahuasca, uh, which DMT is destroyed in the gut when taken orally. So when taken with an MAOI, such as Paganum harmala or Syrian rue, you have the full-blown experience with it. The fleur de lis is found in a lot of Christian art and can be represented as the mandrake. had to use dogs to remove the plant because its shrieks would kill the person. They would tie a dog to it, then call the animal to follow. The animal sprang to obey, pulling out the mandrake, and promptly died. Josephus describes it as a vicarious victim, as it were for him who intended to remove the plant, since after this none need fear to handle it. He also says to touch it is fatal unless one succeeds in bringing along the thing itself, the root, hanging from one's hand, and goes on to say, it possesses one virtue for which it is valued, for the so-called demons, in other words, the spirits of the wicked men, which enter the living and kill them unless aid is forthcoming, are promptly expelled by this root, if merely applied to the patients. Pedantius Discordatius, the Roman scientist and physician, documented the mandrake. While the mandrake was a dangerous plant, it also had to be removed very delicately if it wanted to be kept alive. There is also an alternative method offered for capturing the root. It eludes the grasp of persons who approach it with the intention of plucking it, as it shrieks up and can only be made to stand still by pouring upon it a woman's urine and menses. This creates a symbolic connection between the use of menstrual blood and the removal of the mandrake root. Bitumen is a substance, like asphalt, that raises to the surface of the Dead Sea periodically, in shape and size, according to Josephus, like decapitated bowls. He goes on, the laborers on the lake row up to these and, catching hold of the lumps, 
haul them into their boats, but when they have filled them it is no easy task to detach the cargo, which, owing to its tenacious and glutinous character, clings to the boat until it is loosened by the menstrual discharge of women. The releasing agents for the mandrake were the same as for the Dead Sea's bitumen. John Allegro writes in The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, The Roman botanist from the era of Titus, Pliny, speaks about a fabulous dragon called Basilisk. It could apparently kill bushes with its breath, scorch grass, burst rocks, and put other serpents to rot. It was its blood, however, that was most in demand. Pliny adds that some people call it Saturn's blood, which looks like a reminiscence of the same verbal origin, since the name Saturn is partly composed of a Sumerian word, shatur, womb. One other characteristic of Saturn's blood was that it was the color and consistency of pitch the agent saw a close relationship between the substance of menstrual blood, apparently believing that it was the Earth's equivalent of human menses. According to the Magi, it brought a successful outcome to petitions made to the gods and kings, cured diseases, and, and disarmed sorcery. The last claim was also made for menses, if dabbed like Passover blood on the subject's doorposts. This is why the color purple is revered in royalty. Furthermore, the rue, which shared some of the medical and abortive characteristics of pitch, was highly regarded in antiquity as an antidote to poisons, particularly of serpents. We may therefore suspect that in Josephus's mention of the hot spring of Maturus, the giant rue and the mandrake in the same passage, he is quietly expressing a currently held belief that this particular location by the Dead Sea held special relevance for the holy plant and its antidote. As I mentioned before, the word baras is a play on the word sun. Eleazar and Jesus have the power to dispel demons. The play on the word sun connects them both to the baras or mandrake. This idea of the sun driving out demons is repeated in a number of ways in the typological narrative woven by the New Testament. An exploration of some of the parallels reveals this as a continuous theme. The Dead Sea Scrolls actually describe a fever demon. When Josephus uses infection as an analogy for the Sicarii's activity, he is lampooning the Sicarii as demons. In the Gospel of Mark, there is a description of Jesus' encounter with the demonic of Gadara, a man possessed by several demons. The demons leave the man at the behest of Jesus and enter a herd of swine. Once the swine are infected by the demons, they rush wildly into the sea and drown. Jesus states in the New Testament that the unclean spirits pass through waterless places. Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is described on the onset of his ministry, asking Simon and Andrew and the sons of Zebedee to follow me and become fishers of men. In another passage from the New Testament, Jesus foresees that the cities on Genezareth Lake, better known as the Sea of Galilee, will face tribulation for their wickedness. In the War of the Jews, 
Josephus describes a sea battle where the Romans caught Jews like fish. The battle occurred at Genesareth, where Titus attacked a band of Jewish rebels led by a leader named Jesus. There is some irony in a Messiah who was named Savior inventing the phrase fishers of men while standing on the beach where the Jews were caught like fish. The scene of the Romans catching men like fish also parallels Josephus' description of the laborers on the lake catching bitumen in the Dead Sea. This can connect the menses to the narrative because it is menses that is able to loosen the bitumen to remove it from the boats. Menses is also the releasing agent for the mandrake root. The ancients recognized a homogeneity between minstrel pitch and the resin of trees, particularly the pine, to which the name pitch more properly belongs. Thus the Greeks have the term pisis faltos, that is, as Pliny remarks, pitch combined with bitumen, and this author states that bitumen is commonly adulterated with vegetable pitch. Acacia was another tree whose resinous sap was compared with human menses. Pliny says that its purple gum had the best tonic and cooling properties and checked excessive menstruation. Pitch is not only connected to menses, but also to the Amanita muscaria mushroom because it attaches itself to the roots of pine trees. The connection of pitch with the womb would lead us to expect that it should be thought to have healing properties. Josephus says that it is useful not only for caulking ships, but also for the healing of the body, forming an ingredient in many medicines. Discordates lists at some length the remedial characteristics of, including that it is effective for strangulations of the womb, and that, taken along with wine and castor oil, it drives out menses. The Judean bitumen is the best according to the same authority, and he notes it shines like purple.
It appears as though in early Christian art that mushrooms were related to the feminine aspects of consciousness and the mandrake were related to the male aspects of consciousness. Jesus being embodied by the mushroom symbolically represents the tame or feminized male being introduced into a field of wild mandrakes. Many have speculated that both mandrakes and mushrooms were used as part of rituals to put the future generations of new Christians into highly suggestive states of mind. Amanita muscaria mushrooms contain the psychoactive chemicals ipotanic acid and musimal. Delirient psychedelic, the Amanita mushroom has been symbolic in a lot of Christian art. It is speculated that there were mushroom cults that sprang up in the wake of Titus's invasion of Jerusalem. Much of early Christian art displayed the Amanita muscaria mushroom as well as other types of mushrooms like psilocybin mushrooms, Syrian rue, and opium poppies. These mushrooms have been highly cultivated and are symbolized with their pruned branches. They are shown growing next to mandrakes to demonstrate how they are using these tamed mushrooms to cultivate the more wild mandrakes, which also have pruned branches. The Great Canterbury Psalter shows the plans that the Romans had in mind for the future generations of Messianic Jews. As the Psalters progress, you can see the difference in the cultivated and more wild leaves. John Allegro speaks about the Thracos, a term used for the people of Thrace, the Thracians, the red-haired people. In Greek mythology, Dionysus was a Thracian god, and the Maenads were the female followers of Dionysus, Bacchus in the Roman pantheon, and the most significant members of the Thracius or Thraciae, the gods' retinue. Their name literally translates as Raving Ones. Often the Maenads were portrayed as inspired by Dionysus into a state of ecstatic frenzy through a combination of dancing and intoxication. Allegro points out that in the work of Josephus he refers to a Jewish priest named King Alexander Janus. He, according to Josephus, crucified 800 of his subjects in 83 BC after a failed rebellion and the people called him a Thracian. Allegro suggests that the term Thracian is a reference to the red-cloaked Amanita muscaria mushroom cult that sent them berserk. Discordates, the Roman scientist and physician, also called the mandrake by the name Thracian.
metaphor that the Romans were trying to create was that Jesus, represented by the Amanita muscaria mushroom, was grafted onto the mandrake, which can represent the tree of knowledge, as well as the tree of Jesse, or messianic branch of the Jews. Psilocybin mushrooms were also grafted on as part of this metaphor. And I was startled when I, in Josephus, when I was going through what I refer to as the typologic connection between uh, Josephus's works, you know, in the Gospels, it's all just big typologic uh, interwoven literature. I found this story that essentially describes the whole panorama of Christianity that the Romans had in mind, and it's all about a plant, a plant that they are essentially talking about that is going to be the uh, the function of the Messiah. And uh, then um, uh, Josephus describes the plant, and then he says that after the war, they used the plant to remove devils from the Jewish prisoners of war. In other words, <clears throat> what, what really the, it's a symbolic story. It's a fantasy that, that has a, a point. And the point is simply that they're talking about the uh, reversing the real Christianity or the real Jewish Messianic movement and having uh, the plant, the Messianic branch, the root of, of Jesse, be used as a way to get the, the wickedness out of the minds of the, um, of the Jewish rebels. So in their world, the, uh, the devils were the Jews that were infected with the rebellious spirit. And that's how they are, that's what really the devils in the gospels are. So what was interesting to me anyway was that Allegro had kind of nailed the fact that the Christ was, had some connection to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of plant use. Uh, and, and as I sort of kind of pieced the symbolism together, it looked to me like it was really sort of the, the point the Romans were making is that uh, the Jewish Christ was just a bad trip. You know, it was devilish. It, Put bad thoughts in your mind. And so the Romans were now going to prune that plant. They actually talk about pruning the Messiah in Josephus. And they're going to prune this individual and graft on a domesticated branch, essentially, you know, something that will tame everything down, calm everything down. It is evident from the Paris Edwin Psalter that the Romans were using the Hegelian dialectic in order to implement Christianity, the mushrooms being related to the sacred feminine and the subconscious mind were being planted on the side of the sun, represented by the divine masculine and conscious mind. This is the same for the mandrakes which are being planted in areas with mushrooms and the moon. You can clearly see that the intent of this was to create chaos. The Amanita muscaria mushroom is found in a lot of Christian art. The mushroom shares a symbiotic relationship with trees, 
These mushrooms start out as egg-like and attach themselves to the roots of trees. Once the universal veil is broken and the red cap of the mushroom emerges, as the veil is broken there are remnants of the veil left behind. This is where the white dots of the cap come from. This is the male stage of growth. The veil of the mushroom attaches itself to the inside of the cap of the mushroom, thus concealing its gills. As the mushroom begins to expand, the cap eventually rips its veil. This is known as the circumcision of the mushroom. As the mushroom expands further, the universal veil is separated completely from the underside of the cap, falls and hangs on the stalk or stipe of the mushroom like a skirt. The amanita will continue to grow upwards, flattening itself into a small table, much like one would sit as the keepers of the holy grail. The next stage of the mushroom growth cycle is the cup or grail stage. The mushroom continues to turn upward and begins to resemble a cap or chalice, and will often hold the morning dew or rain. When rain or dew collects on the inside of the mushroom cap, some of the psychedelic substances are drawn into the water. The water is then stained red like the blood of Jesus. The mushroom will start to fade and turn an orange-like golden color. Once this occurs, the mushroom is ripe to be picked, and the water inside can be drank as the blood of Jesus from the Holy Grail. It can then be taken home and dried out and eaten like the body of Jesus. The Amanita mushroom is related to the mythological phoenix. The phoenix is born from its own ashes, but it will never live to leave its nest. It lifts its wings and attempts to fly. It bursts into flames and engulfs itself, leaving nothing behind but its own ashes, and the cycle continues. This can be seen as sort of a cruel joke if you take Rome as the metaphorical tree and the mushrooms as the different provinces of Rome, Jerusalem being one of them. They have a symbiotic relationship with the tree that is Rome. The mushroom provides water to the pine tree, which produces pitch. As I mentioned earlier, the pitch is related to a woman's menses. The mushroom, as symbolized in the mythological phoenix, will never live to leave the nest, and when it attempts to leave, it will burn to ashes. In this way, the mushroom is a loyal subject to the pine tree and provides the water necessary to nourish the tree, which, in turn, produces the pitch or menses necessary to uproot the mandrake in order to domesticate it. The mandrake roots that die essentially reject the domestication process. The roots that live accept the domestication or Jesus Christ, Titus, as their savior, and perhaps symbolically are converted to Christianity, the Amanita mushroom. The Amanita mushroom will never abandon the tree, and when it dies, its spores will produce more mushrooms. Notice the contrast between the Amanita mushroom and the mandrake root. The Amanita mushroom is easy to spot given its red cap. It is mostly above the surface of the ground and can be easily picked and consumed. Opium poppies are featured both as pods and as red flowers. The pods have an obvious drug reference and the red flowers are representative of birth and death. It is also reliant on the pine tree's roots for support.
Palm trees and palm leaves are common in Christian art, also known as Phoenix Dactylifera, palm A. It is connected to the mythological phoenix metaphor and is perhaps symbolically in transition from being a mandrake root to a mushroom. Psilocybin mushrooms are found scattered throughout Christian art. Men are pictured in many works with blue mushroom-like caps on their heads, like these alchemists pictured here. The mandrake, in contrast, is below the surface and is only visible during the spring. The mandrake root is much more self-reliant than the Amanita mushroom, if one is lucky to spot a mandrake, it is not simple to remove, as I explained earlier, with either the ritualistic killing of the dog or using a woman's menses. The mandrake is equally difficult to consume. One must be able to handle the mandrake correctly, or it can be deadly. The mandrake will take out the liver and kidneys if mishandled. The root mandragora Officinarum contains 0.4% tropine alkaloids. The principal alkaloids present are hyoscamine and scopolamine. Atropine and mandrakerin are also present. Recently, the, uh, there was a documentary that just came out a couple of weeks ago, now I'm forgetting the name, uh, about how in Colombia they use an extract of detura of scopolamine to which they just blow on people, get a little bit of this dust on mm -hmm. you, and within a couple of minutes they've got you under control because what happens is that this, this scopolamine in its pure form completely removes the person's self-will. Mm -hmm. And they can tell you, somebody could blow this stuff in your face, this powder, and they could come to you and say, Joe, I want you to take me to your house, I want you to show me where your, where your jewels are, where you hide your money, and you'll just go and you'll get them. They, they've had uh, many dozens of reports of of uh, people actually helping the robbers carry out all of their furniture and this stuff. Yeah. And so now if, if you're trying to exercise the demons out of a, a group of people who won't do your will and you want them to do whatever you say, something like Mandrake, which contains scopolamine, would fit that bill. So we've asked some of our Colombian friends to put us in touch with someone who has an experience with Bruin Dante. Tu problema con el escopolamina es que tú sales bien. O sea, tú sales, hey, ven, vámonos, sí, vámonos, está, está, caminas y vas. Y, y ahora qué? Y, y todo el mundo te ve así tranquilo, ¿no? No es, cha. Claro. Eh, no, el señor salió aquí, lo sacaron así. No, no, la escopolamina es, te atrapa la conciencia, te atrapa a ti. Es una cosa tenaz. Tú, normal como una hipnosis química, sí, desde luego, desde luego, es como, ¿sabe cómo le dicen en, en, en las calles, en el, en, los, en el bajo fondo? Lo llaman el soplo del diablo, porque te roba el alma. Lo tengo ahí. Pero lo quiero que se le, lo verlo. Mira, mira, marica, que no. Con esto ya tienes un viaje para, para 10 personas. Los niños del jardín infantil que aquí a la vuelta, marica. Ya, bienvenidos a Locombia. Sexo, drogas, rock and roll. Satanás. The mushroom and the mandrake are both born from the morning star and are referred to as the sons of God. John Allegro writes, Pliny draws a further connection between dew and the holy plant when he says that even the demonic power of the mandrake is increased when touched with morning dew in a very special way. Then the sacred fungus was the offspring of the morning star, as Jesus proclaims himself to be to the mystic. It thus had the unique ability of forming a bridge between man and God being not entirely divine, nor yet merely mortal. It gave man the power to become for a little while like the gods, knowing good and evil, like the mushroom itself. It 
allowed mortals to become Dioscuri, as the Greeks understood that name of the sacred fungus, sons of God. There is more botanical symbolism involving the babalion, a fungus which translated from Greek is similar to the word Babylon and is attached, like many fungus names, to the squirting cucumber, Elastrian. The common name derived from a Sumerian phrase, gubar, top of the head or glanced penis. Pliny's description of a certain parasite which takes possession of a babalian thorn bush, we must not leave out a plant that grows at Babylon and is grown on thorn bushes because it will not live anywhere else, just as mistletoe grows on trees, but the plant in question will only grow on what is called the royal thorn. It is a remarkable fact that it buds on the same day as it has been planted. This is done just at the rising of the dog star, and it very quickly takes possession of the whole tree. This understanding of the Babalian can give us a clearer understanding of the symbolism used in the Bible. The Babalian fungus can serve as another metaphor for the Messianic Jews. This explains the symbolism of Jesus in a purple cloak wearing a crown of thorns. So Jesus came out wearing the wreath of thorns and the purple cloak. They began to march up to him, saying in a mocking voice, Hail! King of the Jews, John 19.3. The crown of thorns is representative of the royal thorn, and Jesus is representative of the babalian, the fungus that attaches itself to the royal thorn. Jesus dressed in a purple cloak is representative of a woman's menses, which has abortive qualities. The babalian is connected to the Tower of Babylon, or more specifically, the Fall of Babylon. The Babylon buds just as the rising of the Dog Star, which is represented as the star of Sirius, or knowledge. Knowledge, or suppression thereof, is the key to stopping the Babylon from taking possession of the whole tree, which is accomplished with the purple menses. Amanita muscaria mushroom is a denzin of the conifer forests and receives its being on its mother's side as it were from the menstrual blood of the cedar this further supports the theory that jesus eleazar was transformed or converted from the demonic mandrake to the amanita muscaria mushroom the morning star and the evening star are both embodied by venus the Babylonian view is that the two were the same. The morning star is Lucifer, or the light bearer. In modern interpretations, the morning star is related to Satan, but this is an inaccurate interpretation. It is simply a metaphor for the pillar of justice on the Gnostic tree of life. The evening star is Vesper. The morning star is also a metaphor for the pillar of mercy on the Gnostic tree of life. The morning and evening star is bridged by the dog star of Sirius, representing knowledge. If Lucifer and Vesper are not able to communicate with each other through knowledge, then the person becomes imbalanced. In this case, Christianity, a right brain imbalance, is created in the character Jesus, who Christians are supposed to follow. Jesus was domesticated by the Romans in order to create an obedient, subservient population. The Jesus found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was the opposite to the pacifistic Jesus that turns the other cheek found in the New Testament. The Jesus found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was violent and xenophobic and perhaps promoted a left brain imbalance. Furthermore, the implementation of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire in 350 CE eventually led to its downfall, but the structure of the Vatican was already in place to usher in the New Age, otherwise known as the Dark Ages, or the Feudal Period in Europe. 
which had been intentionally caused by the Flavians. As we can say that uh, in the beginning, the Christianity is a, is a drug cult, then we came to the question, uh, what is it now? Mm. In, yes. in moral and ethic... Uh, yes, quite. And for most people, I suppose, Christianity is a way of life rather than mm -hmm. a religion. Yes, yes, it's yes, enormous yes. Disc discrepancy, no? Yes, yes. 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 yes, and one wonders how on earth a small, very inward-looking drug cult be could become a world religion with a lot of power. power. Yes, exactly. A lot of power. Yes. Yeah. As far as the morality of uh, the New Testament is concerned, I would say that this is genuine. But that is, love thy neighbor, was the prime ethic of these people. Have to ask them, yeah. But I think it has to be understood in its original terms, that is, as we see among the Dead Sea Scroll sect at Qumran, a small in-group of inward-looking people who were needing to love one another for the sake of, for the sake of even maintaining sanity. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, you know what it's like if you're uh -huh. living in a small group of, yeah. in a monastery, and um, you have to be extremely careful. Mm -hmm. You get this very much in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in their manual of discipline. You have to be awfully careful about the feelings of the next chap, yes. and, and not to interrupt, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, a little friction can soon explode and, and the whole community direct, falls apart. Love neighbor and distrust That's right. everyone else outside yes, the group. that was That's right. Yeah, huh? Yes, you get love thy immediate neighbor, strongly stressed in the distance. Within the secret. Mm -hmm. Within the of group. The, yeah. But you could hate the man outside. Uh -huh. And the more hate you generated for the man outside, the more you were able to love your neighbor because the hate and love are the reverse of the same side of the coin. You know, of the coin. Now, I think if you understand the New Testament um, uh, ethic in that term of a small community yes. where loving is an important aspect and forgiveness and turning the other cheek is absolutely vital, mm -hmm. then I think this makes sense. But it does not really make sense, and has never really made sense in the human terms of loving the whole world. Author and researcher Joseph P. Farrell writes about the Yahwist tradition, which exists in all three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and the Muslim faith, in his book, Yahweh, the Two-Faced God. But the Yahwist tradition does something very different. By defining itself in opposition to what had preceded it, yes. namely Egypt, all right? Mm -hmm. Egypt, again, being the big symbol of that world culture, yeah. idolatry, paganism, darkness, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. When you, when you look at it in that way, the Yahwist religions replace nature with, and here it comes, with a book. Yeah. Because by the nature of their claims, you must not only believe the message, you must believe the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, you, you are put in, Immediately, and I, we've spoken about this in Foster Swastikas and Psyops, yeah. with the similarity that claimants to abductions and contact with aliens have. Because, again, the contactees in UFO literature are always bearers of a message. Yes. They're bearers of a revelation. Yes. And I pointed out that even with George Adamski, you have a parallel with, you know, not only Moses going up on the mountain and getting his private message from a superior being, you have the same thing with Mohammed. Mm -hmm. All right? So you are put in the position where you must not only believe the message, but you must believe the messenger and his successors. Yeah, yeah. You have, first of all, the authority of the scripture itself, the book. Mm -hmm. which is to be interpreted. And then you have the authority of the elite doing the interpreting. Yes. All right? And, of course, they're not going to interpret in any other fashion that other than to maintain their own authority to do so. Right. <laughs> okay? Exactly. That's where that obedience part comes in. Yeah. Well, you know, so you've got a structure of, of, of a text or a book or a scripture then you have an elite, and then you have the third component of this, which is the tradition of interpretation that's been given throughout history to certain key passages. Yeah. 
Well, that's true in Christianity. If you look at Islam, it has exactly the same structure. Because you've got the text, you've got an authoritative elite, and the imams, mm-hmm. who are schooled in the the Muslim uh, hadith, which is their their form of tradition. In other words, it's what has been the consensus of interpretation of the Quran in the past. Yeah. And that's the key word, consensus. Yes. You must march in lockstep with the infallible consensus, or you are outside the pale. Yeah, and we see this over and over, not only within the history of Islam, we see it within the history of, of medieval Catholicism in the West, you know, with the Inquisition and roasting people alive if they fought outside the box, Yeah, to, you know, Lutherans and Calvinists dunking Anabaptists in the lake with weights on, you know, on their feet so that, you know, they, they had a permanent baptism if they fell outside the, the consensus of, of Lutheran or Calvinist orthodoxy. Oh, my. You saw it in, in communism, you know, if people were not following the orthodox communist line, then off we go to a psychiatric hospital because they're being irrational. Mm-hmm. You know, on and on this goes. Yeah. It's, it's the, the enshrinement of an authoritative text, be it the Bible, be it the Koran, be it Mein Kampf, be it Das Kapital, you know, yeah. this, this system and its opposites, and, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Nazism or Communism are Yahweh's traditions, but since they're mirror secular images of Yahwism, they are bound to reproduce a similar sort of authority structure, and yeah. that's exactly what they did. So, you know, you've got your sacred text, you've got your elite doing the interpreting, and then you've got the infallible consensus. Oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah, there's your, there's your obedience. Mm. And, you know, if you start, if you start straying outside the line, then they send you, you know, a brother or a sister, quote unquote, to counsel you. Yeah. You know, and so on and so forth. In other words, they play the guilt game to the hilt. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, Joseph. It's it's insidious, Georgia. Yes, it is. It is. And I hope people can see this. I do, too. I, I just don't see it. I, I Well, I don't either. That's the point. You know, the, they begin in a division yeah. by defining themselves in opposition to something that preexisted them. So look what you have. You have a division in the social space. Yes. You have a division in the temporal space. Yeah. You have within the individual psyche of the individual believer in any one of these three systems, you know, any human being of any conscience whatsoever is going to have some misgivings about some aspect of them. So there's an internal division. Yeah. A, a perpetual warfare within, so to speak. Yeah. Oh, I haven't had enough faith. You know, I've got to, I've got to run off and join Opus Day and wear spiked belts. You know. Yeah, and, and and wear a, wear you know wear these belts all the time and be celibate for the rest of my life, or pack myself off to a monastery to live the angelic life, or what have you. Yeah. You know. But the bottom line is, is you have all of these divisions that are created as a result of of system. Joseph Atwell has also written about a typological narrative that is present in the works of Shakespeare, which he says was most likely written by a Jewish woman named Amelia Bassano. Right, because you would want to have a certain effect achieved, I guess, as well. Otherwise, why write it? Correct. Right. Well, I mean, her her point is very simple. She's just saying, look, if you understand the typology of the gospel. You get the fact that this is Roman humor and the, the Jews are being mocked as having a human Passover lamb, right? Yeah. I mean, looking at, you know, Roman Catholicism, the whole sim- symbolism is re- concerning the new covenant. And this is all set off by the story about the sacrifice of the new Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. He's, he's designated specifically using typology as a human Passover lamb. And when you actually kind of get the uh, connection between the Josephus work and the Gospels, you can see that um, the human Passover lamb isn't symbolic. They're eating the guy. It's a cannibal joke, right? Yeah, yeah. So now when you bring that perspective to the Shakespearean uh, literature, it's supposed to be comprehensible. You know, it's a little tough because there's like fancy words and whatnot, and she <laughs> goes out of her way to, um, you know, with the 23,000 words and expressions, you know, you might, you know, it's like, what the heck is a person talking about? Um, 
I would say that um, almost anyone with the right perspective can immediately recognize like Titus Andronicus as a, you know, as a, as a spoof of the Gospels. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, I just, frankly, I'm not sure really what value the Shakespearean literature has. It's, I kind of have the same feeling about the Gospels. I, I don't think this literature is, is useful. Um, I don't think it makes better uh, people to read it. <laughs> Right. And I don't think, I mean, it's, I would compare it very much to uh, the apocalyptic zombie cannibalism in our current, uh, you know, genre. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's sick. Now, uh, I mean, so, I've always wondered, Joseph, why it is that Shakespeare has been pushed in the way it has and just this incredible praising around it. And, and, and a part of me has always been, well, some <laughs> of it must be that the complexion, as you said, because of the usage of so many variables in language and everything else, has kind of been attributed to the non-understanding of it. It's kind of the same way when some people look at some modern art. They don't really understand what they're looking at, but they're loving it because their neurons are firing. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that, that if Shakespeare hadn't been promoted by basically by the organization that had produced the literature or assisted her in the production, um, who I think is very much involved in the arts and whatnot, I think that this stuff would have just been forgotten years ago because, frankly, it's crap. I mean, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, what's that about? You know, she meets a guy and then three days later, you know, the, she wakes up and he, he, de he dies. I mean, it's just the, the plots are stupid. The, um, the uh, um, you know, the, the language is flowery, um, but um, incomprehensible quite often. Um, the way it's been promoted just because it makes people who know the um, – uh, the uh, kind of the inside joke, they they laugh, you know, and and uh, so that's it's it's mockery. Um, why 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 were the gospels so popular? Why how why sure. did the yeah. why did the Christianity you know end up as the state religion? Well, it became the state religion not because of any power of Jesus, it was because of power of Caesar and and his organization promoted it and demanded yeah, it. That's right. So with the Shakespeare stuff I would say the first, you know, candidate to explain its uh, long standing uh, uh, you know uh, in you know connection to culture is that it's the same thing. We're just looking at the same thing except this is just the second uh, version version of it, of it updated. Very interesting. Yep.